Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a good lunch break. So you've seen the uh, meme going around, which says, I wonder where I'll go this afternoon. Maybe, you know, uh, La Bedroom or um, Porto Lounge. Well, I think at the moment, uh, in the swapping around that's going on, welcome to my house in Newlands. I've just been unmuted. Does that mean I'm on air? Okay, well, I'll repeat the last bit. Um, welcome to Newlands, everybody. I'm in this uh, crazy time where uh, the most exciting thing is deciding whether you're going to spend the afternoon in the bedroom or the lounge. Welcome to my house in Newlands. And we're going to talk about systems thinking and the art of simplification. Now, I added the last little bit because there's no point doing modeling unless you can also get to the nub of the problem. So let me tell you a bit about systems thinking. We're all typically very detailed people. That is one of the things about being in IT. We're taught to break problems down. We're taught, yeah, to, to decompose stuff. Systems thinking asks us, to take a more holistic view of everything, all the parts and how they interact most specifically. So we actually start off when we're very young as systems thinkers, we, the world around us, everything, it, it's a system. Everything we engage with, our family is a system, the outside world, nature, all of these are systems. And if you think of something like a tree, it's, it's tremendously complex, but it doesn't bug us, we kind of get it. You know, sun shines, leaves grow, rain falls, roots pick up water. We learn these things. But if any one part stops, then the system will decay. It won't work as it's supposed to. So that's what we're going to look at today is what goes wrong with systems? What are systems? How do we identify them? There's some really, really positive good messages in systems thinking. If it's not something you've engaged with before, I hope I... I get your interest. I hope I spark a little bit of interest in this. Also, if you're a technical person and you love patterns, you're going to find some really interesting patterns today because it's a language as well. The whole systems thinking genre is a language of how things work. So next one, let me click it over. Did that work? No. We're going to talk about the upside down triangle to talk about what are systems. Here's the easy bit, elements. Elements are the easy parts to identify of a system. And in fact, this is something we all have to watch. If you have to start a new design, most people think of the entities first. We were to talk about, say, databases. That's the easy bit. I can see it. I can see the leaves. I can see the trunk of the tree. You know, I can maybe see the, all of the roots, but I can know they're there. Pretty easy. The system, though, is also made up of interconnections. And this is much more difficult to detect. So yeah, water is drawn up through the roots and gets spread through the tree. But there's other stuff goes on as well because the tree grows, there's some chemical process that we can't see. We, we actually know now that a tree will make its leaves, will spread a chemical in its leaves to make them bitter for certain types of trees. When there's like a locust attack, well, you know, they're under uh, attack by bugs. I mean, it's fascinating stuff, you know, we saw it's a tree, but um, those interconnections are hard to see. They're often, you know, chemical things or information flows. I mean, going back to our world, all the, it, it's the connections that make things, make things part of a system. And then right at the bottom of my upside down triangle is purpose. Now we can talk about what is a system, but until you describe its purpose, you don't know which elements are really in and which are out. Okay, so I'll make that more clear with my next little example. Try this. It's a nice looking car. All right, so cut back so we can see some of the elements in it. And immediately we're element people, you can go there as a tangible thing. But it's only when I say that its purpose is to safely transport people that we can agree that it needs all of those parts. Uh, does it need the egg bags? Yes, because it must safely transport. I mean, I could define a car as something without seats. 
Yeah, I mean, why not? You could crouch, okay? Except that wouldn't be safe. So all of its parts come together because of the purpose of the vehicle. It's not just to transport people, but safely. Yeah. Right. Now I'm just going to take some pot shots because, hey, you know, you've got to listen to me now. And I like to rant a little bit. Vision and mission statements. I've taken, you know, a generic one, the sort of thing you'll see in uh, many companies. They're all nice, fancy words. And how many companies can actually live them? So if you want to see what is the company really about, and, and it says we care about our employees, but you find out that nobody, they don't invest in training. Um, they're not sending their people to awesome conferences like DevConf. Then you have to say, despite all the good words, we don't believe it. And now we, as humans are actually very sensitive to these things. We can tell when we're being bullshitted, basically. It's very clear. And that is because intuitively we actually get the system. We know it's where we're being played. Right? And it's to keep in touch as well with that sixth sense, if you like, or just basically common sense that says, what's really going on here? Because you have to look at what the system does to determine its purpose, not what it says it will do. Right, come back to that one. Let me give you some patterns. I'm sure you're going to like this because there are a whole bunch of ways in which systems go wrong. And they're nice names for most of these patterns. And do things go wrong? Oh, yes, they do. I put up the quote about Murphy, which I'm pretty sure everyone's aware of, but even more nicely put from the book Systematics, it says, the universe is not actually malignant. It only seems so. Yeah, I think we're all feeling that at the moment. So the first pattern I'd like to discuss, these some things are sometimes called system archetypes or traps, system traps. Policy resistance. Now, the, the absolutely classic example is the war on drugs that America has fought for however long. And the blue line is the addiction rate in the States. And the green line is how much they've been spending. It doesn't look effective from here. What we can't tell, of course, is perhaps the blue line would have grown. But essentially, it would appear that an addict needs their drugs and it doesn't matter what policies are enacted. Unless you can deal with the addiction, you can't fight the drug, right? So this is the point. Everyone's got their own goals. The goal of the addict is to get their fix. The goal of the pusher is to make money. And the nice thing is that the more the police drive it, drugs into something very illegal, the pusher can make more money because now it's a high risk activity. So it actually attracts pushers, right? It, it, it attracts the wrong kinds because it says, hey, we can really make money at this. Well, all right, we can talk about whether it's good or bad and whether there are other ways of dealing with it, but it's a very typical pattern, which is policy resistance. Um, I've also, on, on a business side, uh, you know, people often talk about the, how the employee needs to buy into the company's vision. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But actually all that ever happens we as, as, as workers, we willingly align, if, if the company's goal aligns with ours, we willingly kind of hitch our wagon to the company for as long as it aligns with us. No, nobody ever actually buys into the company's vision. The best that you can hope for is that we align with it for a path. Right. But then again, I'm a cynical person. The escalation trap is a, another nice one. Very easy to understand. Uh, the crook gets a gun, well, the copper has only got his old trench. What you call that thing? Truncheon, whatever it's called. So now the copper gets a gun. So the crook gets a bigger gun. And the cop gets the bigger gun and the crook gets an even bigger gun. And so we escalate. The escalation pattern happens in all sorts of things. It's just an arms race. The hospital care escalates. So the hospital, 
in the town next door has just got fancy, fancy new neonatal equipment. Um, they can uh, have, cope with um, premature babies from 24 weeks. All right. Do you not think that every uh, expecting family will rather book all their treatment through that hospital because if anything goes wrong, they can cope better with emergencies. So the next hospital has to get even more expensive equipment to complete as well. Now, the fact is that only a tiny fraction of people will ever need it. But we're, we've bought into this idea that we need the best at all times, not what we need. So we, we escalate all sorts of things very unnecessarily. I have uh, presented this talk uh, overseas quite a few times, and I always have to explain to them what day zero is. But the Catonians know. Uh, you know. This is when we, we thought we were going to run out of water. But people were still watering their lawns. And it took, it took pictures of, us, of what it would look like if we had to go with our little three-litre or five-litre canister and go fill up at some government-sponsored taps for everyone to panic and go, oh, sure, but we better stop. So, the tragedy of the commons, which is the name of the pattern, says that we're all sharing in something, but you know, if we abuse it, we don't actually feel any pain personally. It's only when everyone starts to abuse it, then we all start to suffer. But individually, you know, we can take more than our share. So we abuse that shared resource because we don't feel the pain. And um, obviously water was an easy one. The, the, the reason it was called common is because it was the idea of a common field and you would, you know, have your cow grazing. Your neighbor would go, oh, nice field. I'll put two cows on. And you'll go, oh, sure. I can also have two cows. Next thing the field is, you know, we all do this. Next thing there's no more grazing. Okay, so we had a, it was a tragedy of the common ground. It's really interesting when you start getting into how do you solve these patterns? How do you make people care about each other? Right. So one way is you try and make each person responsible for their piece of it. And a nice example of that is parking meters. <laughs> right. What we have is we have a common area, which is our ground, okay, the tarred streets of a city. Now they're actually open for everyone to drive on. But we've worked out that if everyone can park on them, um, we run out of parking space. So we put meters up and you put in your well, not as card or whatever, but you basically go and pay for, for your use of that common area, your two, three meters by, by whatever. And now it hurts you to stay too long because the fees are running up. So you get your business done and you get out. So parking meters is a lovely example of how we made people pay for a common space. I mean, it's barely demarcated. It's just a bit of paint on the, line, on the road. But we all get it and we pay because it's enforced. So this is also how systems gain their own life. Because, yeah, it was a clever idea. We'll put up these meters and everyone will pay for it. And then, but what if everyone doesn't pay for it? Oh, now we got a new job. You know, um, it used to be called a meter maid. I'm sure there's a more PC correct term by now. But you have to now have a whole staff system to maintain the system. Oh, systems are tricky things. They, uh, they, they tend to have their own life. And they, yeah, they, they kind of grow bigger than the original intent. Excuse me if I get carried away, I like systems. This is another one, it's called Success to the Successful. It's really a terribly sad little cartoon of privilege. But the nice, uh, nice example to think about on this one would be something simple, a uh, children's tennis match. And the winning kid is going to get some coaching. I mean, doesn't that sound like a nice thing to do? But of course, next year, the winning kid got the coaching. The other kids didn't. So who's going to win next year? Right? So you set up certain people to be more successful. By, by that first little bit of success, they get set up to be more successful. And I mean, we've all heard about things like the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So it's actually a terrible trap, this one. Right. Quite a, we'll talk about feedback loops, but this is one of those which is an escalating one. Here's my least favorite person in all of IT, the hero programmer. 
The trap is called shifting the burden to the intervener. Now, what it means is that instead of empowering everybody around you to get better and to cope with the problem, one person comes in like a hero and fixes everything. And when that person goes, none of us know how to fix anything, all right? And we see it over and over. In fact, organizations still uh, idolize to some extent some of those, uh, you know, the 10x programmer, the guy that's the go-to guy, he can fix anything. I use the word guy, Lucy. Um, but it's a very negative pattern. It really is an anti-pattern. Most of these are anti-patterns because what we want to do is create resilient systems. So we don't want silos and we, you know, all these good things. So here's another nice pattern for you to, to repeat when you're trying to stop the, oh, I'll just do it, you know, attitude if there's anyone in your team. Hopefully you've got nice teammates. Confusing effort with results. Right, so this is the busyness thing. So earlier this morning, I listened to Pamela Hill uh, talking about remote work. I mean, if you caught her session, but one of the most important things she mentioned was how leaderships had to change. And uh, now we're all working from home suddenly in the last uh, week or so. If you're measured by, I'm in my chair, you know, so many hours at work. Wow, you know, Lorraine uh, is a hard worker. She's there from eight in the morning till six at night. That's, it's just busyness, right? What we're looking at is how, how we can change our leadership structures to be outcomes based. So it, especially when you work at home, it, it's not about sitting in the chair, right? I mean, the whole point of remote work is that, gee, you can interleave it with real life. You know, you need to go make lunch, you can get up and right. So effort and results, very obvious one. I've got a lovely little picture of um, for the next one. Rule beating obeying the rules but not the intent so this is the one where the person doesn't do what they should have done but they say no i was just following rules or i mean i hope you can see that on your screens but uh, this camp uh, requires kids to write a letter home you know so let their parents know the kids are all good at, at, at camp and this guy his name is josh he says dear mom I was forced to write this to eat. Love, Josh. Yes, he has written a letter. But he, <laughs> it's not the intent, right? His parents don't feel any better. So they probably do. In fact, they're probably going, yay, Josh is at camp. <laughs> I'm sure you can think of your own examples. The drift to low performance. So especially in bad economies, we hear people say things like, well, we couldn't achieve the, the targets because the economy was bad. This happened, and, you know, it's excuse making, right? And the only way to beat it is to say, this is my absolute standard. Now, I have a teenager in, in the trip. And his favorite thing when we discuss his marks has been for a long time, as he says, but mom, um, I didn't do that badly. There were other kids who were worse than me. And it's all very well to compare yourself to the average. But it doesn't necessarily help you. So you, you need as an organization, as an individual, as whatever, to say, this is my standard. And I will hold that absolute. And, you know, I mean, obviously it should be realistic. But um, the drift to low performance is, is a very common pattern when you need to look for it. Um, so, yeah, and, and spin doctors like this one as well, you know. Actually, you know, this was a really good result, but no, it wasn't. So we've been looking at how purpose becomes misaligned. We've been looking at how things go wrong in systems where instead of doing what they're supposed to, people are pushing back, they're beating the rules, they're, yeah, just finding excuses, right? All very human things. Yeah, but now we are systems thinkers. We want to look at these, these issues and we want to come up with ways of first identifying them and then knowing how to deal with them. Let's look at this example. What is the purpose of a university? Now, normally when I do this live, I have people shout out purposes to me, right? And, you know, it, it varies from help people to get a degree, um, 
do research. Yeah, whatever. I found a really high, you know, fancy sort of statement. You can decide if you agree with it. But to be the guardian of reason, inquiry, and philosophical openness. And, and I think it's what we would want of our higher education, right? It's not just another phase of high school. It, it's where you get learn to think, not just learn to study, right? Okay, so if that is our definition of a, of a university, how might it go wrong? Well, let's look at the actors, the people in the system. What are their goals? Remember I said to you, people never really buy into the system's goals. They have their own all, at all times. The students, to get my, you know, well, I think it's a slightly Americanized thing, but to get a, dipl a diploma or a degree so I can get a good job. Makes sense? Very straightforward. What is the role of the accounts department, perhaps? Well, usually it's to collect money. Now that goal immediately is at odds with the purpose of the university because it's going to drive away students, right? They're going to be people who couldn't pay. Equally, the professors might, their goal might be to publish papers. So that doesn't help the students. And this is how we all end up pulling in different directions within the system, right? And you have to learn how to recognize those things and figure out how you satisfy people within the system to make it resilient. This is pretty weird without feedback. I do hope I've got people listening. Here's an interesting one for you. Back in, I think it was 1907, um, Bakelite was invented. Bakelite was basically the first kind of plastic. A really hard, weird one, but it was a plastic. You might still remember those like hard black phones. It was a Bakelite shell. And, and people were so excited. They actually thought it was going to save wildlife because at that stage, ivory was used for keys, for piano keys. It was used for billiard balls. It was actually used for a lot of practical things, not just jewelry and, and, and that. Tortoise shell was used for combs and, and also a number of things, and glass rooms. There was a lot of stuff with real tortoise shell, right? Hair of things. And um, now we have fake shell, tortoise shell look. <laughs> it was, you know, we were actually killing off tortoises for this stuff. And we were killing the elephants for the ivory. So plastic looked like an amazingly good thing. So how did that work out for us? <laughs> well, you know. We get all excited as, as uh, society and we say, this is the next best thing. And then we don't look down the road. I mean, recently, and I mean, what, last five, six years, everyone got all excited about these micro beads in like your face creams and your soaps because they like, gave such a nice exfoliating wash. Now we're finding that the micro beads are in the stomachs of birds and the seas full of it. It's not like we only did it back in 1907. We keep doing it. We keep. <laughs> the cure, it, you know, is, is worse than the problem. So we, we as humans are really bad at the, the, the holistic thinking and, and working out all the implications of stuff. I have one more bad news story for you, and then perhaps we can start to turn it around on what we can do. So let's talk about a business that everyone knew, maybe still knows. Kodak was really the greatest... A film company for, for many, many, many years. And interestingly enough, um, I mean, they took some risks right in the beginning of their the, of, of film, when film was a new thing. Black and white film was really good quality. And so when they came out with color, it was poor quality. They couldn't get the crispness of black and white. But Kodak said, this is the way to go. Everyone's going to want color. And um, George Eastman, the founder of Kodak, took this big risk and said, we are going with color. And as the quality caught up, of course, they were way ahead of the competition. They became this really great company based on pretty much one uh, courageous decision. Come all the way up now to 1975, and actually one of a 24-year-old engineer of theirs invented a digital camera. And the leader said, <laughs> what was it to do with this thing? People put, print their photos, they put them in albums, they look at them. What do you just, of course, remember in 1974, we weren't all on our laptops, right? <laughs> they hadn't come along yet. So the digital camera was only going to feed into your television. But it 
you mean people had televisions? It wasn't that weird. Anyway, they buried the invention. And six years later, Sony came up with a digital camera. And the leaders went, mm -hmm. okay, I think there's something in this, but you know what? We've got a good 10 years before it really becomes an issue. Anyway, they did it and they did it. And by 2012, they were filing for bankruptcy. And, um, they, they, they'd lost the market of in film, it was gone. They hadn't reacted in time and they'd had plenty of warning. So the message basically on this particular one is that sometimes our bad luck is actually a result of our own actions. Which means that if our policies cause certain outcomes, we can change our policies, right? So, so I'm, I'm basing this is incredibly good news that it's not as the competitors actually just come in and, and run over us. It's that we set up our environment to be susceptible to that level of competition. Right? So this is quite like radical stuff. It's the saying, actually, your success is in your hands. Even when things go wrong, which they do, they go wrong all the time, but it's how you respond. Your policies as a company, as a team, as a family, help very much with how you deal with life. I'm not sure about emergencies, really. Okay, so policy is really important. I'm going to take us now through a little bit of a technical side on how we sort of diagram systems so that you get the basics. So we'll talk a little bit about some basic diagrams because models are, are really important. And um, in system dynamics, which is the school of thought that we're describing now, this is a stock and flow diagram. And the idea is that a stock is something you have. Remember our thing about the elements, the entities? This is the easy to understand part that we got. But stuff comes in and stuff goes out, right? There's this flow. Easy to understand one would be a dam. We have some sort of reservoir or dam and rain and river fills the dam and some of it evaporates and some of it we take off for farming and town use and whatever we do with it. That's all very well. But I'd like you to look at the little clouds that are little fluffy clouds on the end of the drawing. Now those fluffy clouds are just as important as the rest of it. What that is, is the stuff that is out of scope for us. What is not in scope? Because, hell, we could go all the way back to the river inflow. We could start saying that it was affected by too much agriculture. It's, um, uh, you know, the riverbanks have been changed by urbanization. When you're looking at a system, how big you make your problem is very, very important. Because you can kind of keep on expanding that area you're looking at until the problem just becomes overwhelming. So the trick is to narrow what you're interested in down to something you can deal with. And if, if manipulating policy parameters on that piece doesn't give you the effect, certainly you can have a look at what, what else should you be bringing in? What is the big influencer that you maybe haven't looked at? But it, it, it's really important to think about what is in your definition as much as what is out. Right. And then, very, very importantly, our feedback loops. So we have two types fundamentally. We've got a balancing loop and we've also got a reinforcing loop. Let's talk about balancing, that's easy. The balancing loop says, I am cold. I put on a jersey, I feel better again. Right. I had a, the stock was my body heat. Um, I detected that it was too low for my comfort. Um, so the, there's not enough sunlight or warmth, whatever coming in, I'm losing heat. I did something to change that. The feedback loop said back to equilibrium. Okay, so I'm happy. There are plenty of balancing loops. It doesn't need to balance exactly. It just needs to be within parameters that work. But it's pretty much a one goes up, one goes down, and you, you bring it in. Okay, the other one, it's really interesting. This is the reinforcing loop. Now, this is the vicious cycle or the virtuous cycle, right? Because it can go either way. Population growth. Um, we have had in, in a, a lot of Africa uh, an incredible amount of, of population growth. So what happens is the um, medical 
improves, nutrition improves, um, but the cultural uh, requirement to have a lot of children is still there. So populations grow, there are more people, more people have more babies, so they grow more, right? And the good thing is there's actually is a, a balancing loop on that as well, because there's quality of life. So as the quality of life rises, people want more quality of life, and then that tends to bring down the birth rates again, that on television, right? And another nice one to think about is um, uh, cumulative interest, right? If you get interest and then that you reinvest and then you get interest on your interest, well, that's really nice. That's a reinforcing loop. The interesting thing with the, these loops is they really, really can run away. So COVID-19, we're all talking about all of the time, but flattening the curve, because we know that it, that, that just keeps, it goes. Once, once you have a thousand people infected, they infect 4,000, 4,000 infect 12, 12, you know, it, it's just, it goes crazy very quickly. So hopefully you really understand reinforcing loops at the moment. In a team, a reinforcing loop. Um, have you ever noticed that you can work in some teams and you're all really working well and you get one negative person comes in and that negativity just brings the whole team down. So negative reinforcement is, is really interesting because it seems to operate faster than positive reinforcement in certain situations. This, you know, it's really difficult when you've got that kind of death spiral thing going on to turn everybody around and say, hang on, hang on, you know, this is what we're doing, is we're reinforcing our negativity. So here's a little diagram. We have a state of the system, an inflow and outflow. We have somewhere the goal we want, some level, and a discrepancy. The B slash R in my diagram means it's either a balancing or a reinforcing loop. Right? So that's how you draw it. And does that look easy? Right? Does that look easy? Okay. Well, we were going to try one together, but hey, we're, we're not on live, so we'll just have to do with this. It's not easy because it becomes quite difficult to figure out what is the stock, especially when you talk about human things. I mean, is the stock a human? Is the stock my motivation to do something? What is the stock? So your first place is, of course, to look, what lens are you looking at your problem with, right? I sometimes include a slide at this point to just talk about client problems. Um, because so many times as a developer, I've been told um, from a user that we they want oh, some output, they want a report. And if I get that information without knowing why, um, usually you find you've actually done the wrong job because the users asked for what they thought they could get. All right, and until you have that dialogue that says, but what is the, what are you really trying to achieve? How could we do it? Okay. So there's a lot of communication and the modeling is really hard. I'm jumping around a bit. Now I was going, I'm just going to ask you to think about that. Let's say you've got a team that is down. They're just like not, they're not producing, everyone's not happy. Uh, the quality of work's terrible. Now, if I've got a lot of devs listening, I bet you're all going, it's tech debt, it's tech debt. Yeah, it may, may well be, right? <laughs> but what would our stuff be? What, what are the flows? It's a system, right? The team is a system. It's a system of people with a goal um, to produce good work, you know, with a good means for you. It's not that easy, is it? All right. So... In doing this this workshop, uh, as a workshop, I've, I've had a lot of different answers. We'll do this one. We'll say that the effectiveness of the teams are stuck, right? Because I don't think it should measure it in, in actual people. And what goes into that? Yeah, people go into that, but, you know, you've got to have the right people, the right skills, and a whole bunch of stuff goes in. Remember in, in modeling, if you put everything on the diagram, it becomes so messy that you can't get the point of it, right? So um, usually when I do this live, somebody shouts out what goes into it. They say coffee. Yes, I know. Coffee must go in there too, but you don't want to clutter up the diagram. But most importantly, the organization's policies go in. Um, is it an open plan office and we've all got to work like this? Um, 
do you have some flexibility in how as a team you structure your life those policies will make you rigid they will completely change what that team can and can't affect the same people in a different environment might be amazing probably are okay so let's be careful of just looking at the people and look at the conditions under which they operate which are harder to spot all right and what takes away their effectiveness motivation levels how are they supposed to communicate whether they have access to what they need all of that stuff right this is the gap we are not getting what we want so most of us can, can see that we're not getting what we want what we don't know is what to do about it this was just one of my favorite slides actually yes a little bit of a laugh but there is something called conway's law which you might know about and it says that organizations which design systems will produce designs which are copies of the communication structure of the org. So here we have something that um, actually it used to have a Microsoft <laughs> title on it, but each department is basically at, you know, holding guns on each other. They don't collaborate, they're not cooperating. What sort of systems do you think you will design in that environment? They certainly are very unlikely to flow through the organization, right? Melvin Conway. So I've mentioned a few times that you can't put everything that you've thought of onto a diagram. It, it just, you know, you've got to get, simplify your thinking until you're dealing with the key points. So I thought we'll talk a little bit about simplification as part of systems thinking, because I don't think you can become a good systems thinker until you're able to split you know the wheat from the chaff the noise from the, the substance pick a simile so i've shown you again my little diagram of the sun and the planets i don't think they ever line up exactly like that but as a model goes i mean this is kind of the thing i might show my kid to say hey you know that's that's he'd show me by now that's how the world works you know it's how the universe is if i could take you back to Oh goodness, when was this? Oh, 1687, 1687. Good old Newton was, and many others were trying to come up with a theory of how the gravity of universal gravitation, which is how the planets affect each other, not gravity on Earth, the interplanetary gravitation. Now, I just want to mention that in 1687, we couldn't really handle big data. Um, there were no computers to chunk through millions of calculations and, we, and look at the, the effects. So what has been described as one of the greatest simplifications in our evolution as humans is this theory of universal gravitation. So there were no computers. There were hundreds of thousands of calculations if you were to try and accurately work out which, you know, how each planet worked. And Newton's genius was just to say, well, hang on a secky, wasn't that sun kind of big? <laughs> you know, the others were just like little peas down there. So with something so dominant, let us just look at the interaction between the planet and the sun. And he did then turned into a very simple set of, uh, I think there were something like 45 calculations still left. But he did those calculations and that model could be applied and you could check what, you know, did the planets appear to, to, to do what his model showed? And it did. And that was good enough to get us all the way up to, you know, I think it was 1960 before we actually refined the model, which we then could by through big data. So you have that genius to go, hang on a sec, there's one big influence here and, and, and tease it out if you're going to do modeling, whether it's systems modeling or any other kind, very important. Because, you know, that is not helpful. So, where am I in my time? I have absolutely no idea. I think I've got about, about 10 minutes. There are some, some simple rules if you want to do diagramming. The less is more. Don't cross things because that messes up our brains. You know, same thing, keeping it all straight. Trying to put the most important things up. Use my finger again. <laughs> Top left corner. All right, we read from that side, we look up first. So that's where you put things in, in the diagram, put your most important stuff 
up in the corner there. <laughs> okay. And just keep things tidy. It's, it's good for our brains. It helps the person who's reading it. Because an important thing in, in systems thinking is we're, we're trying to leap to holistically to a bigger picture. There is incrementally improving stuff, doing a little bit better. But that doesn't say that you're doing the right thing. It just says you're improving. Systems thinking says, hang on a second, are we even doing the right things? Right? So I'm asking you to have big, grand thoughts. We've talked about this, that if you can bring things into pairs, then it's going to make it so much easier. Uh, you know, we're still talking about the same stuff, um, I don't know, 50 years into to IT, but coupling and cohesion. So the more our methods are coupled, the messier they are, right? Harder to test, you make one change, it breaks 17 things. So we should know that the coupling is, is a thing that we've got to limit. And the best limit of all, of course, is pretty much two. I mean, most things can't live entirely on their own. Um, although if you were listening to the um, event, source, um, event sourcing, maybe maybe they can. Maybe this ones are even better. But yeah, powers of ones and twos. Uh, I picked this little picture just because our eye actually sees red and green, maybe white. And although those reds have got pinks in them and the greens are all different, but our brain is very good at patterns. We're quite quick to say that those variations, they're still all red, right? I, I, I like to hope that everybody saw this as a, a bunch of red flowers on, on some sort of green. Yeah. We don't need to look at the, the lighter shades. If you can get it into ones and twos, even if it's a little rough, that's a huge help in simplifying. The other technique is something called Occam's razor. And this says that the simplest answer is probably correct. And I've always loved that. I always thought that was such a nice way of approaching the world. You know, don't complicate things. But I just thought it was a saying. I thought it was, you know, just something we said. But no, it has a mathematical backing because what we're saying is when we say the simplest answer is probably correct, the less assumptions that we've had to make in coming to that conclusion, and the more likely we are to be right. Because the more assumptions you add, the more things won't be right. <laughs> so mathematically, this is true. I think that's quite exciting. And uh, yeah, so you can sound very smart to talk about Occam's razor, which is to you know, cut it down to the simplest possible. There's also the Pareto principle. I think most people know about that. But this is the idea that um, you can get 80% of the benefit often for about 20% of the work. And again, I think it's really applicable to, to our computer science world because we spend so much time on the exceptions. So if you can um, just remember that you don't have to code everything or design every system to give the same attention level to everything. So the UX guys maybe get this. If you have a form that is going to be really heavily used, this is the key point of the interaction with your users. You should put everything you've got into it. Every bit of UX smarts, UI design, test the hell out of it. But if you have a single setting somewhere, you maybe don't have to put the same amount of effort into the little form that allows you to change that. Right? And all too often we approach every problem the same way. We don't go and say this is a this problem and that is a that problem and, and, and adjust our method of tackling the problem. So keep Pareto in mind as well. So that all comes back to the how do we do it? The less is more, which is Occam's razor, right? The, the keeping things straight, I suppose Pareto a little bit and the, the, the most important is Pareto. And, and that tidying for me, it's not just about the diagram, but it's also about your thinking. But if you can streamline your thinking, remember my clouds? Take What can you take away from this picture to come to what is the, the core thing that's giving you problems in your team, in your design, in your whatever? You'll get very far. The most impressive systems have resilience built into them. Okay, so... You remember how I said I really dislike the, the hero developer who comes in and like just 
fixes everything because it makes the rest of the team less competent. It, it basically disempowers them, right? So the more you've got an empowered team, the more you're resilient. If somebody leaves, it's not a train smash. Resilience in the system is a really, really good thing. I, um, I still do production work. I've, I've coded all my life. I'm a developer at heart. And I still see people writing systems on the basis that everything's got to be perfect. Yeah, I know it does. And we live in a black and white world. But there are ways as well of thinking about how could the system self-maintain? How could it recover from the situation? That if we had more systems that worked like that at an IT level, but also at a human level. So what, what happens if people are unhappy? What, what, what are the avenues to deal with it, right? The better you become at setting up um, meaningful channels for people to talk about what upsets them, you know, the happier you have as a team because they're not bottling it up and you know, nobody listens anyway, right? So common sense, but applying a thinking, uh, a systems thinking brain to it. So the ability, resilience is basically something with, it must have a feedback loop. There's a feedback loop and it must be acted on. That makes for a resilient system. I'm sure you've read the slide by now. If you would like to go further, the book that I absolutely recommend is something called Thinking in Systems by Donna Meadows. So Donna Meadows wrote this really easy, accessible, nice to read book about systems. It's got so much in it, so much wisdom, ways of looking at things and lots and lots of nice practical examples. So that's a really great place if you want to go further on uh, systems dynamics. Just remember, it's not a system unless it's about the flows between things and its purpose. And then there's plenty of other references They're here. I'm sure we'll make slides available after the conference. Um, Jerry Weinberg is a giant of thinking, but very difficult to read, I find. And systematics is just fun if you just want to poke at it. So some lovely people there. And this is the thought I want to leave you with. The system always behaves exactly as it's been designed to operate, which is not necessarily what was intended. Okay. So I'm saying that you can say what you like. The system is supposed to do whatever. But if you look at it and it's doing something else, then I'm telling you that the design has led to that outcome. Okay. That it has been designed to function like that. So be creative and courageous about systems redesign. That's my bit. And I'm happy to take chat. Um, I'm not on the Slack group. I can't look in that many places at once. But if you use your little uh, question mark, you can send me some questions and I'll, I'll take some. Otherwise, I think I'm within a few minutes of my, my time, am I? Yes. Any questions? Okay. Cheers all. Thank you for joining us. It's been fun. <laughs>